Okay, hello everybody. Tony Mormino with Insight Partners. I believe we are now live. I've got my good friend here, Tomas. Tomas, how are you today? Doing very well. Thank you for having me. This is uh, very exciting. Awesome. Thanks for doing it. We're excited and we'll we'll get started. Thank you all for watching. We got a little countdown timer here and uh, hopefully we're showing up well on LinkedIn and YouTube. We're trying to stream this to both platforms. If I could get a shout out from anybody watching on the comments that you can see and hear us, it's always appreciated. We never really know what's coming out the other end. Uh, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Um, it looks Luckily, like it's coming we're both through, having okay? good hair days. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, good hair days. That's important. So I'm in I'm in Asheville, uh, North Carolina, or right outside of Asheville. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew Dean says sounds good. Awesome. Um, I can see and hear you both. That's a good thing. Um, thank you very much for commenting. Awesome. Nick Booker, we can hear you. We'd love to hear where you're from too. I love to see. Um, thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we love to see and hear uh, where you all are located. Thank you, Michael. Um, and he and he met Thomas. He got a little confused because he's dealing with the uh, the ethnic version of that Tomas name right now. With that's right, I got Tomas Novillo and Tony Mormino. So we've got a little we've got the O thing going here. So thank you, Nick. Um, awesome, Orlando, Dallas, Texas, Florida, Dallas, Texas, Augusta, San, San Francisco. Francisco. Houston. Houston, it's really Texas. cool. We get people, we've been doing these for a little over a year live on YouTube and LinkedIn and New York. Thank you, Peter. And uh, it's so much fun to see where people are from. We got another Orlando. Um, we get people from Australia watching sometimes, people from England. We get people from all over the country in the US. Uh, we're, I work for Insight Partners. We're primarily in the Southeast, but we get people from everywhere. And, and Tomas is in, uh, Castle Denver. Rock, yep. near Denver. Castle. Yep, right outside. Hey, do we have any Colorado people watching? Yeah, any Colorado? I got a got a Jacksonville guy. I'm from Jacksonville as well. Lots uh, of Atlanta so far. I think that's the fourth Atlanta. There's Jacksonville. Two. Yeah. Appreciate you guys watching. We're gonna um, get started here in just a second. So, you know, the good news is you can see in Harris. Sometimes you hit the live button and you don't know what's going to happen. So Zealand, Michigan, Stephen. Oh, I've never heard of Zealand. Nice. And, uh, You're probably dealing with weather like myself. Very cold. That's right. We got Charlotte. Augusta. Cool. Thank you all so much for watching us. We'll get started here in just a minute. We're just going to talk about, um, this is a PDH event. So if you need PDH credits for the Carolinas, Jacksonville, Florida, just email me. Uh, my email is going to be in the chat. It's also in the uh, description of the video, and I'll post it as well. Hi, Amir. Amir. How are you, Jason? Awesome. All right, we'll get started here in just minute a minute. Minute thirty. Degrees. And thank you all so much for supporting our online efforts. We really have been having a lot of fun. I hope. I hope that you're getting something out of it, that it's giving, <laughs> giving you some value. We, we hope that it does. David Wenis, what's up? David was one, one of my guys who helped me start this online stuff. So thank you, David, for doing that. We need to get you back on the, on the show here with us. And uh, yeah, we Arvada, so there you. we go. You're right up the block from me. Although it looks like you're in Melbourne, Florida currently. But Isn't that funny? There's people from everywhere watching this stuff. Okay. A lot more... Uh, a lot more people spread out than I thought. I thought this would be a little bit more southeast. This is awesome. Okay, well, we're going to get started here in just a minute. David, yeah. Don't worry, buddy. We can use, we'll use as much, take as much help as we can get around here. So, um, again, thank you all for joining us. Thanks, Paul. Um, we're going to get started here in just a sec and uh, give you some, you know, information on hot water, heat pump hot water heaters give you another tool in your your engineering tool belt and thank you all again so much for joining us at the we'll do our best morning. to keep it uh, light and easy to follow that's right that's right okay i love a good i love a good finish like that okay thank you all so much for joining us again my name is tony mormino i'm the technical sales 
and marketing director with Insight Partners. And this is my virtual handshake guy. So welcome again. And thank you um, for joining us today. We're going to do kind of a joint presentation. We're going to talk about heat pump, hot water heaters. We're going to talk a little bit about what we see in the industry as far as decarbonization and electrification. So a little bit about Insight Partners. Then I'll talk a little bit about my guest, Tomas, and where he's from and a little bit about his company. So our mission statement in Insight Partners is to become an HVAC and solutions provider with a nationwide network of experts committed to your local success. To that end, we have four core, I guess, areas of our business. We are first and foremost a HVAC sales rep. And to complement that, we also have a full service and parts department. And we have a recon group, which I'll talk about here for in a minute. So as a rep firm, we rep all different types of products. Um, some of the common brands we have throughout our territory are Aon, Samsung, Armstrong, Bosch, CDI, Miller Lehman, and Nile Water Heating Systems, which is where Tomas works. We have a full um, parts center and call center throughout the, the Southeast. We're in the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida, and we have parts centers throughout all those territories, and we're adding new ones all the time. So um, and thank you all for the comments. I'm looking at the comments flowing and this is great. I love to see where people are from. So our capabilities, we have a full service organization from uh, head to toe. We do equipment startups, preventative maintenance, repairs, custom controls, integration, and retro commissioning. We also have a Insight Recon Group that rebuilds cooling towers in the Carolinas uh, where we are the Marley Rep. Currently, we have offices in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. We have a total of 13 offices. That says 10. I just noticed I need to update that. So a little bit error on my part. We also have uh, valuable uh, partner companies in Hobbs, which is located in Tennessee, Virginia, and now Maryland, and also Texas Air Systems, both of which are extremely um, uh, are large and very uh, professional and uh, awesome partners for us. So we're glad to be partnered with them. Our website is insightusa.com. You can see all of our manufacturers, who we rep, and who we are at our website, insightusa.com. One of our core values is working together, we're stronger. And to that end, we do a lot of PDH and free educational um, shows online, which is what you're watching here. So uh, we've dedicated a lot of time and resources to create a YouTube channel. And I'll post the links to these in the chat. Um, Insight Partners HVAC TV is our YouTube channel. We have a podcast called the Engineers HVAC Podcast. Come and check that out. This, this uh, presentation will be posted on the podcast, hopefully within the next week or two. We'll see how that goes. And we're also very active on LinkedIn. Um, we're currently streaming this on YouTube and LinkedIn at the same time. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that's coming through okay. And uh, it's been a lot of fun for us. So my guest today is, is Tomas Novillo. He's with Nile Water Heating Systems. This is Tomas's first time live online. So we can give him some applause and some some likes there. It's not easy, trust me, but it is a ton of fun. So a little bit about Nile Water Heating Systems. So they make high quality and efficient heat pump water heaters. They're made in the USA in Brewer, Maine, which is across the river from Bangor, Maine. Uh, they manufacture and sell heat pump driven energy saving products, specifically uh, building industrial equipment for lumber drying, food dehydration, cannabis drying, and heat pump water heating. Their mission is to enable energy efficiency and electrification of industrial and commercial processes, allowing our customer, their customers to transition towards a renewable, sustainable energy system. They've been around for about 45 years, and since 2010, the company has doubled every three to four years. They plan to keep this growth going uh, for the long term to have a meaningful impact on transitioning uh, the world to a sustainable path for the next generations. And that's a picture, I believe, of Brewer, um, Brewer, Maine, which I've been invited to the plant, but I think I'll wait till the summer because it sounds like it's pretty cold <laughs> up there this time of year. Very, so, very cool. um, yeah, <laughs> very, very cool. So, um, uh, one of the things I really like about heat pump, uh, water heaters is the byproduct of the air cooled, uh, version is cold air. So we can use that cold air to cool mechanical rooms, server rooms, boiler rooms, et cetera. We're going to talk a little bit about more of that, but I just thought I'd mention that as a little teaser before we get into the presentation. So this does qualify for PDH credits. T Mormino at insightusa.com is my email address. Please email me there and I'll send you a 
PDH certificate for this course. I will also post that in the chat and I'll put that in the video description if you forget, um, or just reach out to me in on LinkedIn or YouTube and just I'll, I'll get it to you there, get you the email there. So please put questions in the comment section. We will try to monitor the comments throughout. We may wait to the end to answer some or most of them, but uh, you know, please comment away. This is for you. We hope that you take away uh, something out of this and you're gonna see me moving some screens around here, turn the presentation. And again, this is kind of a joint uh, presentation effort. So Tomas is gonna uh, start us off and then I'm gonna uh, throw my two cents in there as applicable. So Tomas, please introduce yourself and let us know what we're gonna hear about. Sounds good. So just uh, as we get started here, I noticed uh, somebody uh, in the chat said they're having uh, problems with the LinkedIn video keeps dropping audio. Uh, just real quick, anyone else in the comments having the same issue? Uh, as well, or is it pretty smooth for everybody else? Can, okay, I'm going to continue, but uh, yeah, just keep rolling. Else, That's fine. If anybody else is having any issues, please uh, go ahead and just let us know. So, welcome to our presentation on heat pump water heaters. Now, we're going to get into a couple different topics here as we get guided into the heat pump water heaters, uh, but I am excited to, to go over this with you. Uh, and who am I? I am a sales rep. My name is Tomas Novillo, and I've got 10 plus years in various industries uh, from information technology, uh, water, and then HVAC uh, and plumbing. I've worked all the way from the rep side when I was doing information technology to water quality, and then uh, with Watts Water Technologies on the, the plumbing side now, uh, doing both the mixture of HVAC and plumbing, which you'll you'll get a better understanding of as we continue through this. So I am a director of strategic accounts with the Nile Water Heating Systems. And as Tony said before, we are a manufacturer of uh, several different uh, heating uh, water heaters from air source to water source. And then we did started in 1977 doing lumber kilns. And from that technology, we've moved all the way over to water heaters as well. And uh, in the last couple of years, we've also knocked out a little bit in the cannabis drying systems as well. So today's agenda, we're going to be going through uh, decarbonization, electrification, and how uh, HVAC is going to fit within the new electrification world. And then what exactly is a heat pump and what types of heat pumps are out there? And what types of applications can you use a heat pump for? So let's get this kicked off. We're going to start chapter one with this decarbonization, and then we will move on to the other one. So as we go along, you're going to see our nice little power station moving across and building. So what is decarbonization? Well, it literally means to reduce carbon in the atmosphere. So anything that is going to help reduce carbon emissions is considered decarbonization and how we can move forward with decarbonization. So the long-term goal is to create a CO2-free global economy. And how we get there is going to be difficult. So that's why I want everybody to take a, take a breath, stop, and realize that we understand no matter what area you're in, there's different different things that people are doing to move uh, to help this movement go. So, yeah, and I'll just say I'll just break in here real quick, Tomas, and thank you again for being here. It's awesome. Um, so you know, whenever we talk about these types of issues, decarbonization, electrification, a lot of there's a lot of feelings that come up. There's a lot of emotional. There's a lot of uh, political um, attachment to these things. We're we're just merely reporting what we see in the industry. We're not taking a stance, whether it makes sense, it's good, bad, or what have you. So, hey, Matt Tooley. Um, so we're just kind of reporting what we see. And again, the movement generally is to move away from fossil fuels and find uh, a different way to, to create energy. And I'll turn it back over to you, Tomas. Thanks for letting me break in there. Thank you, Tony. And that's, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, there's going to be varied opinions on this, especially depending on what parts of the country you're in. We're not here to, to debate those or go through them. We're here to just go over what we can do and how we can move forward. So 
why do we care in the HVAC and plumbing industry? Well, it's because we're burning a lot of fossil fuels currently in the HVAC industry. And a lot of the energy from the units that are created have a major impact on the fossil fuels burned in plants. So we want to obviously give you a little bit of education on what areas within the country this matters in and whether you're in California or Oregon or Washington where the rules are very strict or whether you're in Texas, Florida, uh, Tennessee where the, the rules might not be and you might not even hear it as often. But I think as everybody on the call can agree, it's uh, definitely coming and it is on its way throughout the entire country here. So it's, uh, it's really dependent on where you are in the country as to how much you've actually learned or how much is actually going on in your area as far as uh, engineers, developers, and uh, contractors making it part of their basis of design to try to go electrified. So Tomas, what, I'm in North Carolina and most of our you know, most of our customers are in the Southeast, although there are people watching from all over the country. What do you, and, and Tomas travels, he covers the whole country. So what do you see in other parts of the country that are different than what you would see like in Florida? That's a, that's an excellent question. So in, on the East coast, places like New York city, you're starting to have building requirements to go electrified. Um, these requirements are also duplicated um, and have had a, a head start over in California, Oregon, and Washington, where these rules have come in and they've actually put gas bans in certain areas of Washington. So you, you're not even going to be using uh, gas-fired uh, components in homes starting this year. Uh, California, they're starting uh, the green push at a much faster rate as well. They have requirements even what type of refrigerant that you're going to be using for these units. So these are rules that are coming on that side. Whereas if you go to North Carolina, Florida, it might be a just a, hey, we're, we'd like to start going that way, but there's no government rules or regulations yet. So there's definitely, um, definitely states where it's a much, uh, much higher uh, uh, topic for them than it is in other areas. That's a great question. Got it. Thank you. I'm full of great questions, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> as we uh, continue here, we're going to go ahead and pass that decarbonization area, which is going to push us to electrification. Now, electrification is going to be is going to be the uh, the whole process of which we're going into. So electrifying if the unit's an electric powered unit. That is an electric, uh, that is going electric. So that's electrification away from fossil fuels, um, which the goal of decarbonization is exactly that. It's to go electrified. So it's moving, the electrification term is to move everything from fossil fuels to renewables. So that being said, this is definitely not going to be easy because a lot of the power generated uh, is going to be still coming from coal plants. So there's a process in which we have to move a lot of that over to renewables. So hydro, uh, solar, wind, these types, these types of renewables are going to be where we're moving to. So certain states, you're already seeing those big, uh, the big alternative energies, like these wind farms here that you can see in this picture, solar farms generating in different parts of the country as well. That's the goal is to start moving everything to more electrification. So I, I want to address a few comments here, which is uh, Steve nailed it for, for, you know, if you have an engineering or a scientific mind, you, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know if you stop using gas to heat your water at the hospital and you use electricity and then the power plants using fossil fuels to make that electricity, you're just shifting it around, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's kind of the, the problem with this thing. And again, this is like something we reporting, just saying, here's what's happening, whether it makes sense or not, whether it's possible, who knows, you know, but this is like the way things seem to be moving. The, the ultimate goal is to be free of fossil fuels and just have renewables, which I think it would be great. I don't know how practical that is or how possible that is in, in our lifetime, but that's kind of what, what, what is driving all this stuff. And um, <laughs> Steve said, never mind, just answer. But Matt Tooley had a comment about, you know, He's hearing there's no gas permits being issued 
um, for in New York City right now, like in certain parts of the city. And then Ryan uh, commented that, yes, that's for new construction. So a new construction in some parts of the country, you can't even use gas. So this is like, and again, we're going to talk about this in a second. Hot water heat pumps aren't going to solve all these problems, right? It's just another tool in your um, in your tool belt, your engineering tool belt to to take advantage of. So sorry about that, Tomas. Go ahead. Oh, no. Fantastic. These, these types of questions are exactly what we need. It's going to help us explain it to others who might have those same questions. So please keep those questions coming. All right. So as we move through, we're going to be passing through the decarbonization, electrification, and now we're on to chapter three. How is HVAC going to fit into electrification and the decarbonization world? And what steps are we making towards that? All right. I'll take this part. So yes. thank you, Tomas. I'm going to do the next couple sections here. So we've talked about decarbonization, which is ultimately getting away from fossil fuels, whether it's at the source, I, I call the source like the end user, the hospital, the school, the home, et cetera, which moves us more into electrification. So if we're going to remove these gas heating products, we got to have some kind of power. So that would be electrification. So how do we fit into that in the HVAC world? So that's what the next section is like. Why do we care? How do we address that? And you'll see we're on section three as we build our power grid. We're on section three of five. So you can kind of follow along and know where we are in the in the presentation. So so as where are the opportunities in HVAC, um, I will ask my questions. I ask myself questions like, you know, where do we burn fossil fuels at the building? Um, and then where can we reduce fossil fuel emissions at the power plant with more efficient equipment. Those are kind of the two ways I see that we can help as, you know, I'm an HVAC rep, Tomas is a manufacturer. We've got engineers, contractors, owners, developers on, on here watching this stuff and we'll watch it in the future. Um, thank you all for doing that, by the way, we appreciate it. So uh, where, where can we, what can we do to help with this, these protocols? So um, the thing that comes to my mind is we heat a lot of water and air with gas. So that's kind of like the low hanging fruit um, as to where we could fit into this. For this presentation, we're going to talk about heating water mostly, um, but air is another way we could apply heat pumps. So when we look at heating water, what if we're going to do it, we're going to take electricity to use to heat water, then what's an efficient way to do that? Well, the most efficient way I know of is a, is a hot water, a heat pump water heater. You know, what you're not talking about renewables, we're not talking about solar or anything like that. We're just talking about pure electricity to use to heat water. So um, heat pumps come to my mind. That's why we invited Tomas here. That's why we we rep their their stuff. Um, and again, this isn't a perfect solution. This isn't going to solve a, a, any major part of the problem, but it's another tool in the toolkit you can use if you have owners who want to move that route. This is something you may want to consider, um, and we're glad to help with that if if we need to. So like, here's, here's what I say. So what? I don't live in California, New York. And I know where that most of this is driven in California, New York, right? Maybe Washington, Oregon, stuff like that. But I don't, I don't live in that area. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's say I live in Florida. Why do I care? Well, a couple of things. And Tomas already touched on that. Um, this is kind of our take of the industry. We say go, it's coming. Like whether we like it or not, whether you agree, it's makes sense engineering wise or you, you're in your political world, it's coming anyway. So it seems to be coming this way. Um, as an example, you know, we have an owner and, and let me back up and say this, you know, a lot of these major owners might not be in our area, right? Like you might have a, a corporation that's headquartered in France and they're setting policy for all their factories around the country, or you might have a head, they might be headquartered in California, right? So we have one of those scenarios. We have a large manufacturer in South Carolina who's been told by their corporate, you know, entity, Hey, you're going to turn the gas valves off in seven years. You know, like, yeah, that, that sounds great. How do we do that? Right. Like, it's going to cost a lot of money to do that. Right. So, so they have makeup air units and paint booths. How do we heat that air, um, without gas, right? Gas is a great way to do that. If we're going to remove the gas, maybe heat pump, hot water heaters will help with the hot water core. That's something we're looking at. So that just, I just show you that as an example of, you know, this stuff seems to be coming, whether we, whether we like it or not. The other two things I really like about these types of products is you get a, when you're heating the water, you get a bonus side effect, like a, a, a byproduct. And that is either cold air or cooled water. So you're getting a benefit from that while you're making hot water, you can cool air 
or cool water and use that as energy savings. So those are three kind of like my take is why you would care um, if you're not in a state that's mandating um, these, these issues. So to recap, we talked about carbonization. I'm sorry, we talked about decarbonization, getting away from fossil fuels. We talked about the electrification process, how, you know, we talked, we didn't talk about much of the challenges, but man, you think about like, if we're going to upgrade all the power grids, the power lines, the transformers, the power plants, we need more renewables, more of this. So that's a huge, colossal um, effort. In my, in my humble opinion, maybe smarter people could figure that out more than I can. I don't know. We talked a little bit about how HVAC, how this fits into the HVAC world we live in. And again, like heating water with gas, that's, a sim- that's a, one of the simpler things to look at using, you know, an electrified product like a heat pump um, on that, in my opinion. So the next section here, which is section four, and there's only five sections here. The last section is products and applications, which is a little bit longer, but we're getting through this pretty good. Thank you for all the comments. We're going to, um, we're going to, we're going to address most of those at the end here, uh, but please comment away. We will address them at the end at the very least. So, um, all right. So heat pumps. So what are heat pumps? Let's look at how a heat pump works, how they can be applied in making hot water, and then we'll actually look at some product installations, some examples, and some application um, issues. So how does a heat pump work? So when I'm talking about heat pumps with engineers or contractors or developers, I'm trying to like put it in a term that put it in a sense that they they can understand or they're familiar with, I should say. And the home is a good. Uh, everyone's familiar with that. Most homes, I don't know how many homes in the U.S. have split system heat pumps. If anybody knows and wants to chat, uh, that, that'd be great. I'm assuming it's a large percentage of homes have split system heat pump technology installed. So what happens here is in the summer months when it's hot, it's acting as an air conditioner. And in the winter months, it's acting as a heat pump. So here's basically the general way a typical heat pump works. And then we'll show you how that is used to Heat water. So at your home, you have this outdoor unit right here, which is called typically called your condensing unit. There's a compressor and a, a coil in there. And then you have your indoor unit here, which is your indoor air handler. And obviously this is a very basic, you know, diagram here just to show you. So what this heat pump is doing is you're actually cooling the outside air. So you have outside air here, let's say 40 to 60 degrees, whatever it is. It could be much colder than that. You're taking the heat out of that air by cooling it. So the air comes into here. And this coil in the heat pump mode is your evaporator coil. So it's actually making the air colder, comes out the top, blows out to the atmosphere. Now, you've removed heat from the outside air, and we're going to put that or pump that into the indoor coil. So the compressor through the refrigeration cycle transfers that energy to a coil inside the air handler, which is now your condenser coil, which blows blows hot air. So how this would work is, you know, in my in my house, we keep the heating on 66 to 70, depending on if my daughter's home, if I'm home, my wife's home or whatever. So let's say it's 66 degrees, um, 66 degree air would come in here. It would hit the hot coil. It would gain 20 degrees ish and it would blow out, uh, six, uh, 88 degree, 86 degrees, something like that. 90 degrees ish. So that's how a heat pump works. So you're removing heat from one source and adding it to another source. Another way to say it is you're cooling one source, either air or water, and adding that heat to another source, which can be either air or water. So why do we use heat pumps versus like electric heat? So heat pumps are very efficient at heating. So the COP, the coefficient of performance is like the EER for heat pumps, right? So the higher the COP, the more efficient it is. So typical heat pumps, three to five COP, when you compare that to electric strip heat is at one. So you can see there's a three to five time, you know, efficiency gain from using heat pumps versus electric heat. That's a no brainer, right? So that's why a lot of homes have heat pumps installed, but we're here to talk about water. So I'm going to shift over to heating water. Um, but I wanted to show that cause I think it's a good example to show people who aren't familiar with, with heat pumps, exactly how they work. So let's apply the heat pump concept to heating water. So if you look at this refrigerant diagram, you basically have a compressor a condenser, a thermal expansion valve or TXV, and then you have your evaporator coil. 
Okay. The four, the four types of components you have in any refrigeration cycle, right? From a water fountain to a 2000 ton centrifugal chiller, they all have these four components. So in the heat pump, hot water heater, the way this works is we're taking heat from this source, which is the warm air. We'll talk about what that could be. And through the refrigeration, through the compressor, we're shifting that heat over to the condenser and we're heating hot water. So we're moving the heat from the air, we're extracting the heat from the air and we're putting that into the hot water. Is that a uh, double wall um, condenser there? Great question. <laughs> we, didn't plan, we didn't plan that at all. By the way. So yeah, that's a double wall. Thank you for reminding me to mention that. So the condenser, since you're using potable water, um, you have to have a double wall uh, in most cases. When you're, do, when you're heating potable water, you have to have a double wall condenser because if you get a refrigerant leak, you don't want it to get into the, get into the water that someone may be able to drink or, or get on their body, et cetera. So very good question to Tomas. Definitely didn't have that previously set up. <laughs> no, not at all. We didn't rehearse this at all. So um, no, thank you, Tomas. So that was an air to water. So this is an example of a water to water, which again, we're just taking heat from one source. And we're going to talk about different sources and we're moving it over to another source, which is your condenser. So we're going to extract heat from some sort of water stream and we're going to, through the refrigeration cycle, efficiently transfer that heat over and heat water. And we'll look at some examples of that as we get further in here. We, the best scenario is to take heat from a stream of water that you're already removing heat from, like a chiller loop is a great example of that, right? You know, if we can remove some of the heat going back to the chiller, we save the energy with the chiller. If we, um, a condenser and water loop is another area where we could remove heat that we're going to have to remove anyway. So it saves money on your cooling tower, et cetera. And we'll look a little bit more at that. And the gist of this is, um, you know, we're cooling one source, which is air or water and adding that heat to another source, which is either air or water. That's kind of the gist of the heat pump situation. So to recap, and I'm going to kick it over to Tomas here in a second, but I'll just recap here real quick as we move into the products and applications. And I hope you guys are enjoying this presentation. If you are, please, please feel free to throw us some likes and some thumbs ups and some claps and some heart. Well, I don't know about hearts, but you know, anything you, anything you could throw us, we appreciated it. It always makes us feel like you guys are getting something out of it. So decarbonization talked about that moving away from fossil fuels, um, one way or the other. And we didn't really talk about nuclear, which is a whole other, like, you know, probably, you know, the easiest to make this happen would be nuclear as far as from just an engineering science goes, but that's just my own two cents. Anyway, so electrification, putting more stuff on the electric grid, um, which has its, its challenges, its complications, but that seems to be the way it's going. We talked about how HVAC um, could fit into this world and, you know, gas heating, Water is a, uh, a good way to um, change to electrification simply. And we talked about how heat pumps work. And now we're moving into section five as we complete the power grid and move into the final section. And please, again, comment any questions you have. And I'm going to go ahead and share your screen, Tomas, and kill my feed. And you are ready to go. Teach us up on some what these products look like and how we, they would be applied. So. Excellent. So we're actually going to be going through what types of uh, heat pump water heaters are out there and what types of applications can they support. So as we go through, we're going to be looking at air to water heat pumps and how they work. So as uh, Tony was explaining earlier, you've got to get energy from somewhere. So with the air source units, you're actually going to be taking uh, heat from surrounding air, and that is going to be your driver to create hot water. Now, with these uh, heat pumps, you're generally going to get wa hot water up to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. You're going to be hitting that COP of up to 5.0, uh, and it's going to vary from unit to unit. Uh, the heating capacity um, on most heat pump water heaters is going to be anywhere from 25,000 BTUs to 250,000 BTUs, 
Um, and then as we were talking about again earlier, what's that dual capability? Well, they're going to also be able to do cooling. So you're going to have a cooling capacity from 20,000 BTUs all the way to 220,000 BTUs. That's a significant amount there. And here's where we get into uh, the decarbonization electrification part that we were talking about earlier uh, with the different types of um, coolants that are out there. So right now, uh, uh, most units that are out are using R134A or uh, CO2. Um, and there is a new refrigerant that a lot of units are putting in right now, and that is a R513A, which is a low GWP um, uh, coolant or uh, refrigerant, sorry, that's out there. And uh, what GWP stands for is global warming potential. So it's going to hit those marks better as far as uh, having less likely amounts of it to, hit, to have an effect on uh, decarbonization. So it'll, uh, in effect, uh, be more positive for the decarbonization movement as we move that direction. Um, so as also, as Tony mentioned, uh, we're, we're talking about the refrigeration cycle. Um, all of these units are going to have a double wall condenser. That's for potable water heating. That's so that you can drink the water. There needs to be that double wall heat exchanger in there. Um, and then... Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, so like um, the way I like to think about these products is there's chillers, but they're heat pumps, right? Like you have a air cooled coil um, and then you have a heat exchanger. So it's a, it's a heat pump chiller is the way I used to, I kind of think about it. And um, the question I had was, so the hot water is up to 160. What do you typically see for entering water? Um temperatures it, into the units i'm sure it varies i think we talked about this but that's it that's a great question it is definitely going to vary i mean you're not going to get the same water entering temperature in uh let's say florida as you are in even california you know it might be uh 40 to 60 degrees in california whereas in uh, florida it could be 90 degrees entering so there's uh, definitely going to be some differentiators depending on where you are um but it's going to be able to still hit that mark of up to 160 degrees, obviously taking into account about a hundred degree lift. And I so, know we're going to look at this a little later, but typically, right. These are hooked up to a bank of storage tanks. They're not taking the direct water in from the makeup water. It's mi all mixing in with the tank, right? Right. So it's going to be a constant multi-pass loop. So multiple times through the unit and through the storage tanks. Um, constantly heating the water, and they're going to run anywhere from uh, 12 to 16 hours per day minimum uh, to make sure that you're always having uh, the right amount of hot water in those storage tanks. Great. And then you'll have a temperature probe in there, which is going to measure the temperature to make sure they need to kick on whenever that temperature lowers. Got it. And we do have a few questions that are kind of applicable to this. Um, Sean, I think it's Beelman. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right. Can it make 160 degree water with the compressor only. And there's another question, do these need electric resistance heating coil? Uh, well, that could be a separate question. So can they make 106? So inside the unit, it's only the compressor and the refrigeration cycle making the 160 degrees. I right. believe that's correct, right? Right, exactly. Um, so yeah, the answer to that is, is yes, Sean, and thank you for asking. Um, do we have a Delta yeah. T on the hot water rise? We talked about that anywhere from 40 to 60 entering up to 160 leaving. Um, and then John Ratton, like this question, what's the lowest operating temperature? Um, so that's going to be dependent. There's different units from 25 degrees on some, uh, 35 degrees. And then you have some that are actually hitting a 10 degree, uh, for some air source units that are out there. So that is a variable, um, change on which units you were looking at. So the lowest operating temperature I would say is a 10 degrees ambient right now, at least, um, for the units that I'm aware of. And those would be outdoor units too, I'm right. sure. Um, uh, but again, you can, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say they can be outdoor, indoor, but yes, if they going to hit that mark, that would be set up for outside. Absolutely. And we had another question about the COP. Um, how does the COP chain with change with the ambient temperature? And as it gets warmer, the units are more efficient. So Right. Heat pumps get less efficient as you get colder and colder. So that is a good question and something to look at because they will approach at some point um, in the low below two 
it has to be right. pretty cold for it to do that. So that is something um, definitely to look at. And John Rattenbury had a question. Do these need electric resistant heating coils to supplement heat input? I think that would be it. It depends question. Like, do you ever see to. these hooked up with hot water heaters with electric resistance coils or, or is this primarily it? This is primarily it. Uh, okay. That's a good question though. I'm uh, I, one of our engineers would probably have a better answer for that one, but yeah, look at the, is. look at the application for sure. D a great question and something, you know, you don't want to, it's a lot easier to add a little heat electrically now on paper than it is after the fact. I only know that cause I've been there a few times, so it's not a whole lot of fun. Um, right. I like this comment here. Uh, I've got a heat pump water heater in my garage. While it does provide some cool air, my favorite part is the average cost of hot water heating is about $5 a month. I need to get one of these if it's only $5 a month to heat the water. That sounds um, pretty good. But uh, okay, so let's see. What else on your slide? Let's I'll kick it back over to the slide here. So uh, my favorite part of these products is you do get this cold air that you could do something with. And if when we talk about the water to water, which we will in a minute, you'll have a cooling effect of water that you can um, relieve the capacity off of other devices like a chiller or cooling tower. Um, we talked about the GWP, the double wall condenser. Uh, the okay, so I think we're good on that slide. Perfect. All right, so now this is the, um, oh, and actually let me jump back. I'll, I'll read what uh, Ryan Green said. He's my counterpart over there. He was able to answer uh, the question. He said, electric resistance is only required if source temperature is expected to go below minimum ambient ca capabilities. So definitely highly unlikely in Florida and uh, most projects in California do not. So it, again, it's really dependent. I would say the Midwest areas, uh, colder climates, you might see that, but uh, not in those Southern yeah. states. Good question. Thank Great you, Ryan, question. by the way. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan Green. <laughs> So this is a, an illustration of the inside of the air source unit. Now, as you can see, we went through what the refrigeration cycle uh, looked like and how that works. And that's going to be the key components of how these function. So now here's to, uh, to, to put it to an actual visual for you. So you can see the compressor. You can see the evaporator, heat exchanger. And then um, you're also going to have that uh, therm thermostatic uh, expansion valve that we showed you, uh, and then the uh, con condenser heat exchanger right there on the bottom. So one of the things I do want to cover, the one differentiator between the air source and the water source is the, is the condescent drain. You're not going to need a condensation drain if you're uh, doing water to water because you don't have that uh, condensation coming through uh, like you do when you're pulling in hot, humid air. You're going to have some condensation from that. So you do have a condensate drain. So when you're looking at the two units, that's going to be a big differentiator. And then you're also going to have a big size differentiator as well because you have that massive evaporator on the air source units, whereas very small evaporator in comparison on our water source units. So that is what it looks like on the inside of an air source. And let's go ahead and take a look at what they're going to look like when we're doing some of the dual capabilities here. So this is what it's going to look like in a boiler room or mechanical type room when you are trying to have that added effect of cooling as well. So it's going to pull in that warm air, push out that cool air into that space. And you can see the storage tanks like uh, Tony was talking about or earlier, where are we storing the hot water? It's going to be right next to it. So those are where the water is going to be getting put in and constantly cycled through to make sure that they're heated. I have, a quick, I have a quick comment yeah. on that, Tomas. Apologize. Um, so like when I first saw this, my thought was this basement or mechanical room would just keep getting colder and colder and colder and there'd be condensation because this thing's just running 24 seven. And, and Tomas reminded me, they don't run all the time, right? It's only running when you need um, hot water. So it's looking at the hot water tank. The cooling is just a byproduct of that. So 12 to 16 yeah. hours a day, maybe, you know, in some applications you're running. So you don't, you're not going to cool you know, keep pumping cold air into that space at all times. So I thought that was worth mentioning, Thomas. And that's a, that's a great point. I like to, uh, I like to say that um, all the time is to let people know it is a byproduct. It is not the primary source of what these units are doing. Always when we're talking about these dual capabilities, it's a byproduct. So thank you, Tony, so much for clarifying that. That is an important uh, point. 
So same thing we were talking about earlier, you wanna move air somewhere from these units. Well, let's say you wanna push it somewhere that's a good distance away. Well, you can duct these in and this application right here, there's several pictures of this exact application, uh, but this one is pushing all of that um, cool air actually outside. So it's gonna be pushing it right by the garage door and pushing it outside of the space. So here's the other side of these units. There's gonna see, you can see three in line right here, all ducted in a row. And as we move three, you can see there's two other heat pumps directly on the other side doing the exact same thing. They're ducted in a line and pushing all of that cool air outside. And this is what it's gonna look like. Here's the vent pushing it outside. And as you can see, there's a gate there, but it's not a solid gate door. This is one that still has those vents, so it'll push all that air out of there. Tomas, can I make a comment real quick? Um, can you go back one slide? I just wanted to comment on, um, from, from an application standpoint, like you see these things are ducted, okay? So you can duct this air to a server room, to another room, a battery room, or an IT room, or something like that. If you're going to do that, please keep in mind that this is the air that's going to blow is just a byproduct of the heating demand, the heating call. So you want, like, for example, if you're putting this cold air into a server room, you want to make sure there's another sensible device in there, like a ductless split system that's actually monitoring the temperature and making sure it's staying at the temperature needed. Same thing with any room that's critical. Um, if you put it in a mechanical room, you might not care, right? So, but if you're putting into, and don't put it into a room where comfort cooling's because it's not going to be that. Um, uh, does it's not going to be that? It's not going to control the cooling, right? It's just going to be a byproduct. So we had a question here: Does ducting require an additional fan? No, because you'll see on the next slide. I think on one of your next slides, you'll see the standard condenser. Go ahead and fast forward. Uh, one more slide right there. So your typical fan is a propeller type condenser fan, which is like on every condensing unit type product. Um, if it is going to be ducted, there is a ducted fan option. And that was shown in one of the previous slides when it showed the cutaway, it showed the centrifugal blower fan. So um, we have a different fan available when, or most manufacturers, if you're going to duct their product, they should have a different type of fan than a propeller fan. Propeller exactly. fan there. So uh, exactly. thank you thank for the you questions, for by the way. Very good. So, and, and actually on this slide, since we're, we're here already, this is just another example of exactly what we were talking about, where you're uh, just cooling a space and using that dual capability inside. So again, you're bringing in that hot air, pushing out that cool air, and you've got your, your storage tanks right there. So um, yes, you will, when you're ducting it, there's obviously options for the fan, and then uh, it'll depend on which, uh, uh, which ones are out there. Uh, and which ones have availability to do the ducting. All right, so not, I, not all air source are gonna be indoors and not all air source are gonna have dual, uh, be used for dual capabilities. Sometimes you're gonna just wanna put the, uh, use it for just potable water and you wanna put them on a rooftop like these ones right here. So this is an example of a couple uh, air source units on a rooftop, just heating the water, no dual uh, capabilities on these ones. These ones are just, bringing in the outside air, using that for energy, and creating hot water. We did have a question from Sean. Is the COP lower for ducted units? I would say yes, because anytime you use more power, you're going to lower the, the COP. So good question. They would be, they would be lower, yes. And so on these slides, this is just another example of different types of ducting. And I like going through these just so that you can see the variable uh, hookups, how they set it up um, and what they were doing with it. So this one is just another example of ducting. And here is an example of a, uh, of a residential unit. Now, this one's going to be very different. This is probably one of my favorite slides to review with everybody. When you look at these uh, residential units, if you notice, that's a, another another unit already you know uh well when you hook up an air source unit to a residential one you don't have to uh, turn off that or i mean you don't have to get rid of that old tank that was that you were using to heat up your water whether it be a gas fire tank or an electric fire tank you can actually use that now as your storage tank so you can bring in an individual air source residential unit 
plug it right into the input and output for the uh, in and out water connections. And now you have a storage tank being utilized for the unit. So here's another example of that. And you can either mount it on your wall, put it on a couple cinder blocks like they did here. But this is an example of just reusing that old, uh, old tank for storage. Now, I do want to uh, tell you that with these types of units, you probably have a high cost to do things like retrofits. You have to remove all those gas fire tanks or electric ones and put in new units. Well, you don't have to do that with these. You can plug them right into the old units. You also have the ability to, uh, to be just heating the water. So these tanks don't have direct heat going to them, which means the tanks are going to last longer. So when you're doing retrofits or looking at projects like these air source units like this that are residential are fantastic to use because they give you that, uh, that dual capability there of still cooling that space. Also, you're using an old gas-fired unit. So uh, very, very cool, cool application on that side of it. Yeah, so what comes to my mind is like two reasons to do that. One is the energy savings. If you're using electric, like I use electric in my house and I'm pretty excited about one day, wink, wink, getting one of these somehow, Tomas. And, uh, or if you use gas and you want to get away from gas, those are two reasons to, um, you'll have one in no time. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to talk about some application stuff real quick here. So I'm going to share mine and unshare yours. Okay. So real quick, we, we went through some pictures there. I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, some applications here. Let me put on my pen. So this is the drawing we looked at earlier of the air to water. So we're, we got this warm air here, we're taking heat from, and we're putting it in the condenser here. So let's kind of look at how that would roll, um, on site. So some applications of warm air we would put into the quote unquote evaporator would be mechanical room, ambient air. Um, especially if you have a mechanical room with a lot of pumps in it, VFDs, boilers, a thousand tons, terrific chiller, you know, you've got a lot of stuff making heat. That's a great, um, place to pull to pull heat from, which you would want to cool typically anyway. Um, and of course, your outdoor ambient air is another source to pull heat from. Now, you could take that cold air, and again, with the caveat, please talk to your rep, make sure you've got it all figured out about how you're going to control temperature in the space, because this is, you're just going to get what you get out of these units as a byproduct of the heating. It's not controlled on the cooling aspect. So maybe you want to blow this cold air in a mechanical room, server room, electric room, IT room, transfer room, or a battery storage room. Typically, places that have a lot of sensible heat, no people, um, and you have another device to control the sensible heat in the space, like a ductless split system comes to my mind. Um, and then the byproduct of removing that heat, uh, two things. One, you get to free cool space, if you can, and you get to make hot water out of it. And again, high COPs, three to five uh, for heat pumps. So um, good application there. So I believe the next slide is Mr. Tomas, the one and only Novillo. There you go. Okay. Take, now we're going to talk about water to water and we're almost done. We're just going to go through a few water to water slides, talk about some applications, and then I'll hit um, some of these questions here. So take it away, buddy. All right. So the water to water. Now, as we went over before, the biggest difference is going to be that evaporator. So now you don't have to worry about having that massive evaporator. So you're going to be able to have it in a, a smaller size here. So as you can see with the water to water units, they're going to be absorbing water from heat. They're going to be absorbing heat from waste streams. So just like you brought in that hot air to create energy, you're going to be bringing in uh, water from other sources, whether it be a condensed water loop, geothermal, you're going to be using that to, uh, to now create the energy to heat the water. So a lot of these marks that I'm going to be showing here within this slide, as you notice, I'm going to be going through them. They are exactly like the air source as far as the, the capacity, um, heating capacity, the COP, what the water goes up to. Cooling capacity is going to be the same range as well. And then uh, the refrigerant. Now that's going to use the same R134A or it's going to be able to use the R513A low GWP refrigerant. There are CO2 uh, heaters out there as well. So th those uh, units are available in the market.
So all of these units are going to be using double wall condensers, as we said before, because you're doing it for potable water. So definitely, definitely going to need that. Uh, and so then Moss, this, I'll break in here with a quick question. Um, yeah. Because we had this in the chat and you're talking about, does it, do you ever have a scenario where the evaporator is double wall as well as a condenser? That's a great question. So our evaporators are just single wall. You don't need it because they're going to circulate through that compressor and then it's still going to hit that double wall before you have the water output. So um, the that, I really like that question. Not necessarily with our units. You're not going you know, to see that on our side. I can't really speak to others what they might have. Um, you could, always use a, you could always use a, um, another heat exchanger in the loop there as well. It's like an alpha level right. or something like that. So if, you, exactly. if that's a concern, you could always separate that with another heat exchanger. So. Exactly. Um, okay. Beautiful. Thank you, Tomas. So I'm going to show you again. Here's the internals of the water source. Very similar as far as the components on the inside as we were looking at with the air source. Biggest difference is now you have that hot water coming in um, and uh, that's source water coming in, source water out. So this is what, where you're going to be having that energy come in to create the hot water. So everything else, very similar, evaporator, condenser, uh, and then you have the compressor down there as well. So very similar bones to this one as the other one. All right, so this is a picture of a couple water modular units. Now, these ones um, have a higher capacity going all the way up to 2 million BTU hours with these ones if you stack them side by side. So water modular units also uh, very good applications with those. Uh, now, here's what you're looking at with the when you're doing recovery, heat recovery with some of the units. So this is an actual example of what that's going to look like. You can see the water return and you can see where it's pushing that hot water as well. And also you might say, well, those look a lot smaller. That's what I was talking about. These units are definitely smaller than the air source ones because we don't have that big evaporator in there. So I believe that was a chill water loop. We were yep. cooling exactly. before. So we, we, t we typically do there. We'll talk about this at the last slide, but typically what we're doing there is like a side stream. We're pulling some of the 55 degree water you would normally send to the chiller. We're cooling that, removing heat and, and heating water with it. So typical heat recovery application. Exactly. All right. Now you can see this beautiful copper piping hooking up these water modular units as well. This is just a nice example of them being able to fit uh, real nicely side by side. And you're getting max BTUs out of these bad boys. And they're not that big in comparison to those air source units. And uh, if you're looking at that water, water side, Definitely a fantastic uh, solution here to save space and still get uh, max BTUs for that. And then obviously still have the, uh, the ability to do the uh, condenser water loop, geothermal loops, other, uh, other ancillary things like that. So very cool. All right. And I think this is where Tony takes back over. And I'm going to okay. kick it over to him. Thank you, Tomas. Just as I got like two slides left here. So thank you all so much for watching. If you're if you're going to leave, um, I put my, um, we do have one or two more slides, but um, I put my email in the chat on YouTube. I'll do the same thing on LinkedIn when we, before we close out, but email me for PDH credits. And please, before you go, please like this video. We would greatly appreciate it. And uh, so I'll just finish up real quick here. So water to water, we were talking about that. I'll go through this kind of like we went through the um, air to water. So we're, again, we're trying to cool a source either in this case, water and heat another source with that. So when we look at this diagram, typically we call these heat recovery, hot water heaters, um, even though we're kind of there to water as a heat recovery too, but typically call these heat recovery, hot water heaters. So where can we get this um, hot water from? A couple of ways we can do, or where can we get the heat from to heat the hot water in the condenser? A couple different areas. And we looked at a few of these earlier. So if you've got a water cooled chiller with a condenser loop, that's a great place to take heat from because you have to cool it anyway. So if you got 95 uh, degree water going to your cooling tower, you could take some of that and remove the heat from it. And you can use that heat in a refrigeration cycle to heat your, heat your hot water. What does that do for you? Well, it saves energy with your cooling tower and it also saves wear and tear on your cooling tower. It also saves a lot of water because it's less water you got to run. Um, and you lose a lot of water in cooling towers through evaporation. Another 
area is we looked at this in one of the previous slides, a chill water return loop. So you've got 55 degrees coming back from chiller. You pull that into the system, you pull some heat out of it, you cool that down, you send it back into the system and you're alleviating some pressure off of the, the chiller components. Uh, water source heat pump condenser loop, kind of the same thing as the first one. So if you have this condenser loop, you got hot water in there, you can cool it down. You're going to cool it down anyway with your cooling tower. So you might as well take the heat from there. If you have a geothermal application, you have a bore field and you know, you could take some of that heat rather than, um, putting it into the heat ground battery as you, as it were, and you could alleviate some of the, the pressure off of that. So I wanted to finish up on time here. I think we, I think we did again, this was meant to be just a general intro. We didn't try to keep it kind of light and not real super duper technical application specific. Of course, we are always available if you have questions um, on any of this stuff. And again, if you need PDH uh, certificates, please email me, tmormino at insightusa.com. Um, if you're an Insight Partners customer, email your rep if you can't remember this one and he'll he'll email me and I'll, I'll get you the certificate. But um, so we're gonna go through and see if there's any questions here we can answer. Please stick around if you'd like. If you have to go, we understand. Please like the video. We'd appreciate it or share it or like it or comment or whatever you want to do. Um, we greatly appreciate that. I'd like to formally thank Tomas. And again, we're going to stick around for a minute and answer some questions, but just wanted to uh, close it out with a thank you to Tomas. Tomas, any last words you want to say before we hit the questions here? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And if anybody has any specific uh, questions or interest in different types of applications with these, uh, by all means, uh, reach out and we'll uh, we'll guide you through it. I think you can reach out to Tony and uh, Tony will send you my way. Um, but this was uh, obviously a, a big education on just how heat pumps work, not an advertisement for, uh, for our company. Just wanted to kind of educate because there's still a lot of question marks about what are heat pumps and how are they used today? So... Awesome. I put on a little music there for your closing. I don't know if you guys can hear or not. But, um, thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. Jimmy Hunt. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Jimmy, Wendell, Bruno, Ryan. We'll ask, ask some few questions here. Um, I'm going to go back up. I think we may have missed a couple, but... Um, I think we have Aaron Flack answering these, who's uh, my counterpart, and Ryan Green is answering them as well. So thank you. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Both Ryan Green and Aaron Flack for answering these YouTube questions. You guys are fantastic. I thank you so much. I genuinely appreciate it. Custom awesome. solution for both HX and controls. I'm just looking here to see if we missed any questions. Um, great job. Bruno, thank you. Wendell, if you want to get your name mentioned, say we did a great job and I'll make sure to yeah. <laughs> mention it. Um, some of these I don't. Let's see. Buddy White. Thank you, buddy. Uh, TWM. Thank you. Uh, Alan, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, did we talk about coil coding? Yeah. I think Aaron asked, answered that coil coding yeah. question. Am I am I correct there? Yep. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. I owe you lunch, Aaron. I heard it. it you, it's being recorded, Aaron, so make sure he lives up to that. <laughs> Something nice, too. Um, we talked about too, right, monitors. Right. I think somebody answered that. Yeah, Ryan, that was a big help having you. I think we got all the questions. Um, yeah. If we didn't... Um... Oops. Please let us know. We're always available. Um, and just in case anybody has a pen or pencil nearby, uh, my email is my first initial last name, so T Novillo at nile.com so uh, if you guys have any direct questions or wanted help with anything you can reach out to me as well awesome thank you and i just figured out a new feature so i could put the comments up here in the future and we can address them that way so awesome um, okay well i guess we'll go ahead and close it out um toby thank you and again if you need uh if you need a pdh certificate please email me tmormino at insightusa.com. If you have any application questions you would like us to answer with Nile, Nile's help, um, then please email me or comment here or message me. If you're watching this on LinkedIn, message me on LinkedIn uh, or comment on YouTube. I'll be monitoring those as well. And um, I'm going to put the little uh, countdown timer on here and do a little countdown here. And then we'll close it out here in a few minutes. And Thank you, Tomas. If you don't mind sticking on for a few minutes, we'll let this Absolutely. run down. And thank you all so much for joining us. 
We greatly appreciate it and hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye, everyone.